we have a okay. okay so good afternoon uh, thank you for having me i'd like to thank the leadership at uh, morgan state university for the invitation particularly miss aquanetta pinchback and dr uh echo Banglo. so i'm going to talk to you today about vaccines and antivirals uh, for COVID-19. My name is Donald Alcindor. I'm an associate professor at Meharry Medical College. I'm also associate adjunct professor in pathology, microbiology, and immunology in the Division of Infectious Disease at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. I'm a former HHS Vaccine Injury and Compensation Program voting member. I've also been on the FDA advisory board as a voting member. I'm currently the director of research for the Tennessee SEAL program I sit on the expert advisory panel and a member of the American Lung Association COVID-19 Action Initiative. I'm also on the American Lung Association Scientific Advisory Board. I got my PhD at the University of California, Davis. I, my initial degree was at an HBCU, Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I went on to LSU to get a master's degree and then to UC Davis to get my PhD I did my postdoctoral studies at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and the NIH. So I want to talk about, let me just uh, minimize this. Okay. And so I just want to talk about the cumulative deaths that we see in the United States. So the United States have led in this epidemic from the beginning, and it's no different as we look at it today. There are more deaths and more infections in the United States than any other country. And so we are having to deal with this in, a, in different ways. And so the infrastructure to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, weighs very heavily on the economies on the globally. And so in terms of the uh, unvaccinated, so the unvaccinated populations in the United States are basically where this infection lives. Just want to minimize that. And so when we look at vaccinations of all ages, many of people are getting vaccinated. Uh, many of them are fully vaccinated. But at the same time, we have pockets of people in the United States that are still unvaccinated. What is very good is that the elderly, people that are 65 years and older, have a high vaccination rate. But again, we see also at this point in time, we see anywhere from 1,200 to 1,800 deaths every day. And we're not done with COVID. And I can say to you that, uh, again, there are things about COVID that worries me, and I'll talk about it during the talk. So today I'm going to talk to you about vaccines and antivirals. And of course, antivirals are directed against the virus replication cycle, how the virus uh, basically replicates inside the body. And these are drugs that specifically target the virus and not human cells. And of course, anti, <clears throat> I'm sorry, vaccines are basically developed to give you maybe most times an injection of a particular reagent that has a small portion of the infectious agent in an innocuous form, either treated, attenuated, heat kill, or for that matter, only a subunit, meaning a protein is given to you as an injection to expose your immune system to a novel antigen. And of course, your immune system will respond by producing antibodies and immune effector cells. And so when we look at vaccines. Vaccines have provided us with considerable success in terms of preventing viral diseases, bacterial diseases. Vaccines have modest and often no therapeutic effect on an individual that's already infected. Antiviral drugs can stop an infection in an individual who's already infected. An antiviral drug can also have a prophylactic value in terms of therapeutics. So the idea is that if you're infected, an antiviral can be effective, or even before you're infected, it can be prophylactic. Both are subjected to changes in the efficacy due to strain variation and genetic mutations that can occur in a virus or a bacteria, making it uh, able to escape the immune functions. Vaccines target antigens and epitopes. That's parts of proteins and, and other components on the virus or the bacteria. An antiviral is designed to disrupt 
virus replication pathways, how the virus develops and interacts with the host cells without affecting the host cell function. So that's very important that the antivirals and the vaccines are going to be safe. And that's why you have clinical trials. So we have a number of types of vaccines, that is live vaccines that are given to you with the virus is what we call replication competent, meaning that it can cause a, a small infection, but not a serious one to cause disease. And then you have the live attenuated uh, vaccines. These are vaccines where the organism has been treated in a way either genetically or empirically to reduce its infection capacity, making it somewhat non-infectious, but still being able to present a full repertoire of antigens to the immune system to generate an immune response. And of course, we have kill inactivated vaccines where this particular protein or virus is treated in a way to inactivate it, to prevent it from being able to initiate an infection. And then we have toxoids, where you have toxins that have been taken and isolated from bacteria. And of course, they have been treated in a way to make them innocuous in terms of causing disease, but serve as antigens for an immune response. And of course, we have cellular fraction vaccines where you have small components of the infectious agent, a subunit of it that can then be introduced to the immune system to create an immune response. And of course, we can have recombinant vaccines where you can put vaccines together by genetic uh, manipulations. And so when we look at antivirals, there are a lot of antivirals out there from many diseases that we know of. And so for HPV, there are many antivirals. For hepatitis B, for CMV, these are viruses that cause general infections. And of course, there are antivirals and for herpes simplex and influenza, RSV, and of course, hepatitis C virus. And of course, some of these uh, uh, antivirals have curative abilities. The hepatitis C antivirals, some of them are curative, meaning that they can cure a person of a latent hepatitis C infection. And so getting to coronaviruses, I want everybody to know that you've had experience with coronaviruses that you just don't know about. And that is, you have to go all the way back to the 1960s to see some of the early coronaviruses that were out there. They didn't cause serious disease in people. These are called the commonly circulating coronaviruses, the OC43 and the 229E strains in the 60s and the 70s. These viruses infected people routinely, children routinely, but they never got really sick. And as one thing that these viruses did not cause, that the virus that we're dealing with today does, is that it causes upper respiratory infections that lead to acute respiratory distress. Now, acute respiratory distress is a type of lung failure. The, the lungs are damaged in a way that they sometimes cannot recover. And that person then is not able to undergo oxygen exchange or perfusion on their own, requiring mechanical ventilation or ECMO uh, support. And so those individuals are more likely to visit the ICU. And if, can, if you're more likely to visit the ICU, you're more likely to uh, die of COVID-19 infection. So it was not until 2003 that we saw a SARS COVID virus. This virus never made it to the United States in a serious way. And of course, we didn't see it. But this virus is quite deadly in its own right. And then after that, we saw other commonly circulating coronaviruses, the HKU1 and the NL63 viruses. Again, these viruses cause very mild disease, mild respiratory diseases. And of course, in 2012, we saw a very deadly coronavirus arise in the Arabian Peninsula called the MERS coronavirus. And of course, this virus has a fatality rate of 35%, which is about uh, where the SARS COVID 1 virus has a fatality rate of about 10%. But now we get in 2019 to the SARS COVID 2 virus that we're dealing with today. And I want to say that the MERS virus didn't really make it to the United States, but it killed about 8,000 people and it caused a lot of problems. And again, these viruses can revisit us, and that's a concern for everybody. Now, the SARS COVID 2 virus that was in 2019, we are dealing with it right now. 
we are dealing with a concept that we've never seen before with the commonly circulating coronaviruses. And that is the genetic variations that we see in the SARS COVID virus compared to the viruses that we saw in the 1960s. And of course, the HKU1 and the NL63 in the 2000s. And so this is a very different thing for us to deal with clinically and in the laboratory. And so when we look at the coronavirus family, what we see is a group of normal uh, uh, coronaviruses that don't cause disease, the so-called commonly circulating coronaviruses, and the ones with the green, red, and the blue, blue arrows, you can see that these are the deadly coronaviruses that causes tremendous amount of comorbidity comor and mortality in the general population. And again, 10% uh, mortality for SARS-CoV-1, about 3.4%, and that varies dependingly. Again, in people that are older with underlying comorbidities, the mortality rates would be higher, but the MERS virus being 35% in terms of mortality rate. And so what we see on this virus is something that's very important. The virus is studied with spikes, the so-called corona like the sun, and that's where it gets its name, coronavirus. This is a virus that has the largest RNA genome that is a positive sense RNA genome that can easily get into a cell and start to reproduce itself in the form of making proteins that will assemble this virus and allow this virus to replicate in a very efficient way. And this virus will do this all in the cytoplasm and will never have to visit the nucleus to replicate itself. And so when we look at this coronavirus, we want to recognize one particular protein in this cartoon, and that is the spike glycoprotein. This spike glycoprotein has become famous because this is the protein that all of the vaccines have been developed against. This is the protein that you have seen genetic variations that have led to the Delta and the Omicron variant. And the idea is that changes in this spike protein will give this virus different characteristics in terms of causing disease, causing uh, being able to be highly infectious and highly transmissible as well. When we look at this virus, we clearly see that we do a genetic comparison of full length genomes in these viruses, we see something very clearly that the closest virus to the human COVID-19 virus is a bad virus. And so again, that's, that's not a surprise because bats carry coronaviruses, but I think it is a surprise to find out the closest coronavirus to the COVID-19 virus is a bad virus. And again, for this to happen, there has to be an intermediate zoological host, another animal species that can pick up the bad virus and somehow change it in a way genetically that it can now uh, be able to be cultivated in a human person, okay? And so I'll go this through br briefly. This virus gets into your cell and immediately it starts to make a very important protein that allows the virus to replicate itself. And the idea is that when this happens, all of these proteins are assembled into a functional viral particle that will be released from the infected cell to infect neighboring cells. Now, when we look at SARS-CoV-2, you have to know the symptoms. And of course, this virus is transmitted to a person by their T-zone. That is, again, through the action of coughing, sneezing, and talking, or singing for that matter. And of course, the hands are very good in facilitating this infection. That is taking materials from a surface that a person has sneezed on or whatever, coughed on, and then transmitting that by touching your nose or your mouth. And of course, a myriad of symptoms will happen, fatigue, chills, fevers, headaches, and so forth. These are specific symptoms and nobody will have the same. Some people will have headaches and nasal congestion, other people will have loss of taste and smell. So it varies for every individual. Most people will have an asymptomatic infection due to the SARS-CoV-2 primary acute infection. So we should know the symptoms. And again, fever, congestion, runny nose, loss of appetite, sore muscles, sore throat. Everybody knows these from people that have talked to. Now, there also is something where you have to think about 
looking at other infections that can, that can actually fool you and make you think you have COVID-19. But COVID-19, sometimes it is very difficult to differentiate it from flu, the common cold, or even RSV, which is respiratory syncytial virus, because many of these symptoms overlap. And so this is referred to in the clinic as using differential diagnosis to be absolutely certain that you're infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus as opposed to something else. Now, when you sneeze or when you talk or when you sing, you basically release a cloud of transmitting particles that can carry virus and deliver this virus in the air or in an elevator or anywhere, particularly when you're in close contact with another person and cause that infection to spread. These particles just have to fall on a person's lips, eyes, nose, or hands, and then they can facilitate that infection in other ways. Now, when you talk, let's say you're infected via the oral cavity with SARS-CoV-2. On your salivary glands in your mouth, there is receptors for the virus. This receptor is referred to as the ACE2 receptor. This ACE2 receptor can bind to cells of the salivary gland, initiate an infection, and in no time at all, you have an amplification of that virus in the mouth that can be coughed or sneezed and, and spread to another individual. Now, what we know is that the virus can pass from the saliva across the gums and into the bloodstream. The virus can go down blood vessels in the neck and get into the chest and to the heart. The virus can then be pumped from the heart into the pulmonary arteries. And of course, the virus can develop and be delivered to small vessels in the lung periphery. And of course, finally, the virus binding with the ACE2 receptor on endothelial cells can upregulate a very important uh, uh, compound called angiotensin II. This compound can raise your blood pressure cause you to have oxidative stress, inflammation in the systems. And of course, this can lead to multiple organ failure in a person, particularly depending upon their comorbidities, that is other con medical conditions they have. Now, I just wanna say that the receptor for this virus is everywhere in all sorts of cells and organs of the body. This virus can bind to this receptor and initiate an infection. And so when we look at it, this ACE2 is everywhere in all of your organ systems. And again, this would support the notion that this virus can cause a systemic infection. And when that happens, the person is in critical condition at that point. And of course, what you see is that you will have people getting infected. And in so many days, some of them, the infection will be mild and self-limiting. Others will recover. There'll be some that will have to, a small portion of them will have to be, uh, will not recover and need hospitalization. Some of them will go to the hospital and recover there. But again, there are others that will have complications. And again, won't be able to shake this virus. They will have to go to ICU. And for those individuals that go to ICU, some of them will recover. And again, ICU usually means mechanical ventilation. And of course, what it's saying is that you can't breathe on your own with the way this virus is, is uh, damaging your lungs. This requires mechanical ventilation. And of course, those individuals that can go on to breathe on their own will recover. Those that won't will pass away. So there are many ways that we use to screen a person for this virus. Usually it's a nasal swab. And we do something called the PCR test. And the PCR test allows you to extract RNA from a nasal swab specimen. That RNA goes through a process of being amplified in a machine. That machine will interpret the results and tell if a person is positive or not. The other way you can have an antibody test or an antigen test that is put on a slide. And then on that slide, they have antibodies or antigen that can bind either to an antigen or antibodies in the blood of a person telling you if you're positive. One good thing about the antibody antigen test is that they can tell you if you've had a recent infection as opposed to an infection that you've had for a long time. 
The PCR test cannot tell you that. It will only tell you a positive or negative result of an acute infection where you're still making enough virus for the machine to pick up. So the percentages of the US population that died, you can see that age is a determining factor in terms of those individuals that are likely not to survive if they get an acute infection. And the reason is simple, is that they will have a number of underlying conditions, heart disease, diabetes, they've had a stroke, they've had hypertension, uh, they've had many different things at that point. And this infection becomes too much on the body, too much on the system. And they're likely, uh, more likely to have serious side effects or for that matter, uh, mortality in that population. Younger people, quite different. And so what we, what we know clearly is that when we look at people and we look at the vaccination rate in the different states in the United States, it's very clear that you see less mortality in those states that have high vaccination rates. That's clear. And that tells you that the vaccine is working. And what we have that's very important is that many people that are older are vaccinated, and that's good. And so there's a complication that leads to increase uh, likelihood of you having severe disease with COVID-19 that people don't talk about. And that is a medical complication of obesity. Obesity can put you at risk for diabetes, hypertension, cancer, uh, pulmonary disease, non-alcoholic fatty, fatty liver disease, and other kinds of things. And then you can go back to the, the, young, the people that were first diagnosed in China, that those that were obese had more of a difficult time with the COVID-19 diagnosis. And this is something I published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine, looking at diabetes and the increased risk for severe COVID-19 disease. It turns out if you're diabetic and you're hypoglycemic, and as a clinical presentation, you are given what we call corticosteroids to treat uh, an infl inflammatory condition that's associated with COVID-19. It turns out these steroids that they give you can increase your blood glucose levels even further that can lead to lung damage and also reduce your ability to respond to an antigen and develop an immune response and clear this virus out of your system. Now, for those people with hypertension, it is very clear that the buildup of that molecule in the center there, angiotensin II, is very important. It is converted by ACE2, which is the protein that the virus likes to bind to on infected cells, to angiotensin II. And so this angiotensin II, if it's blocked by the virus, can lead to an upregulation and, of course, high blood, uh, uh, high blood pressure, inflammation, fibrosis, and oxidative stress. And that subtle can lead to lung damage, kidney damage, heart damage, and damage to your blood vessels as well. For those individuals that have cardiovascular disease, it puts them at an increased risk for severe COVID-19 disease because there is evidence that there are proteins and factors that are part of an inflammatory condition in those individuals that get COVID-19. And it turns out that the virus can directly bind to cells in the heart and cause them to die. This can lead to uh, heart injury. And of course, heart injury can lead to heart attack. And of course, having COVID-19 as well puts these individuals at increased risk for more severe disease. And finally, lung disease. If you have COPD, you're a current smoker, have interstitial lung disease or asthma, you're gonna be at increased risk for more severe disease of COVID-19. So people that have COPD and are current smokers, they have observed increased expression of the ACE2 protein on pulmonary epithelial cells. So you can see that if that happens, more likely you can have increased rates of infection if that happens. Now, this virus, when it gets into your lung, it is looking for a particular cell type called the type 2 pneumocyte. This type 2 pneumocyte carries out important functions in your lung. And when it's targeted and destroyed by this virus, those functions become very critical in order to allow you to basically breathe, 
to allow you to have proper gas exchange when you're taking a breath. And so when you're taking a breath, that oxygenated blood has to be basically passed to your other organs in order for you to keep going, to feel well. And so when those cells, these type two pneumocytes are destroyed or dysfunctional, this can be a challenge for oxygenated blood to get to other parts of your body. This is a very important slide. On one side, you see a good resident alveolar macrophage. These are cells that actually do cleanup in the lung. And then you see the type one and the type two pneumocytes that are happy and well. This is a functional lung. You're going to have good gas exchange. On the other side, this is a part of the lung that's been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Right away, you see inflammatory compounds being made. These are proteins that cause inflammation. And oftentimes, you will also see cells from the blood entering that particular uh, alveoli, and, and they want to find out exactly what is going on there. And as a part of doing that, they come in and release their uh, proteases and infl inflammation uh, compounds as well. So you have a problem. This is an injured alveolus. And the idea is that it can't carry out its function in terms of helping you breathe. It becomes problematic. And if enough of these alveoli are destroyed, then you cannot breathe on your own. You need mechanical ventilation and you're more likely to die if it gets that uh, far. And so I wanna say something about the pathology involved in post-COVID syndrome or what is referred to as long COVID. And it turns out a lot of this is happening to people that have had COVID in the past. They have continual muscle pain and fatigue, loss of taste and smell, cardiac dysfunctions, hair falling out, brain fog, and so forth. And the idea is that it may be there for a lot of reasons. Many of these individuals didn't get the vaccine. And again, if you got the vaccine, you have less of a chance of developing long COVID. And again, many of these individuals got COVID early on. Some of them are still dealing with lingering symptoms of long COVID. And so what you're starting to see is uh, university teaching hospitals developing a plan, a multidisciplinary plan to start looking at ways to treat people that have long COVID. It turns out if you have long COVID and you get the vaccine, a certain number, about a third of those individuals that have long COVID that get the vaccine get better. And so there are ways to treat this and for everybody it's different. And the idea is that this is a subject and topic that needs further investigation. We don't meet COVID-19 just by itself. We meet it with everything that we are, our economic stability, our, neighbor, our relationship to our neighborhood and environment, the education, food, community, and social context, and our access to the healthcare infrastructure. So our social determinants of health, if they are poor, we are more likely to have a more serious, serious complications associated with COVID-19. If you have to work and you can't afford PPE, this is a problem. If you live in a multi-generational household where you can't do social distancing, that's a problem. If you have less access to the healthcare infrastructure and you have underlying comorbidities that, is not, that are not managed, then you are more likely to have more severe symptoms of COVID-19 that can put you in the hospital. And so what we see here is that we have underserved uh, communities, non-Hispanic Blacks and Hispanic Latinx populations with certain medical conditions that would put them at higher risk for uh, COVID, that is hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and asthma compared to non-Hispanic whites. We see that the jobs that we have can put us on the forefront of being able to be infected with COVID-19 as well. Being, uh, that is frontline workers that are more likely to be close together when they're doing their work, not allowing for social distancing and, and, and that kind of thing. And interacting with people that might not have PPE or for that matter, not uh, wearing a mask and so forth. And so in the, in the beginning, there was lack of awareness and misinformation and disinformation. 
And of course, in certain communities, that information, misinformation ran rapid. And again, that mistrust of the mainstream uh, and of course the legacy of racism, uh, stigma and discrimination, and of course the Tuskegee effect, all of that plays into vaccine hesitancy and vaccine resistance among underserved communities and rural communities as well. And so we start with the vaccine. The vaccine was very important. We had to do this very fast. Remember they were putting people in refrigerated cars in New York City because they were dying so fast. They were sending people home because they couldn't, didn't have room in the hospital. And when they looked at their vitals, they knew they wouldn't survive. So they sent them home to die with their families. Traditionally, what we have seen is that it takes 12 to 15 years to develop that vaccine. And if we did that in the midst of this COVID pandemic, it would have been catastrophic. The Trump administration came up with a plan and that is, it was Operation Warp Speed. And don't mind the name because it can be misconstrued. But the idea is that the mission was to deliver 300 million doses of a safe and effective vaccine by January 1st, 2021. It gave a handful of companies that were gonna do this $10 billion to do it, meaning that they were taking money off the table, meaning that do it and money was no object. And so, they started to do it. They did something very important to cut the time down. And I wanna show you that on the next slide. So traditional vaccine development in discovery to find out what kind of vaccine you're gonna make and what particular antigen is going to be a component of the vaccine, that can take one to five years. The preclinical studies that might go into mice, mice and animals, that can take two to four years. The phase one, one to two, phase two, two years, phase three, two to three years. And of course, review and FDA approval takes more time. And that's the normal process. However, we simply could not wait that long. We had a national emergency on our hand with the COVID pandemic. And so there are many viruses that the companies chose to look at, and these are the main ones. So most of the COVID-19 vaccines that are out there, there are the whole virus vaccine, RNA vaccines like the Pfizer and Moderna, protein vaccines like Novavax, who has not yet been approved, and viral vectors like the AstraZeneca or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And again, all of them are trying to present this spike protein in the context of allowing your immune system to see it and make an immune response to it to protect you from infection. And so this whole concept that we heard a lot about in the beginning and not much about now is developing herd immunity. Herd immunity is the concept of having enough people vaccinated where the virus has no place to go and it dies out of existence. And so the idea is that we don't know what those numbers are, but what we see is that COVID-19 will be a virus that we may have to live with just like we live with influenza and the people that die of it every year. And so the clinical trials, the exploratory, preclinical, clinical, FDA review, and manufacturing, this is traditional. And it takes a long time for all of this to happen. And so the idea is that the preclinical study, you're gonna explore how the new drug might work. In phase one, you're gonna explore the safety. Phase two, effectiveness of the drug. Phase two, also the exploring the safety and effectiveness compared to the current available treatments. So you might have a comparative analysis. And then you need, FDA review, and of course, phase four to follow these individuals that get the vaccine for years to come. And so the strategy now was one that when you think back, it was very inventive, you know, very novel in sense where you'd start with an academic research. You know what antigen you want, the genetic sequence of the virus was provided by the Chinese very early on. And then the clinical trials were overlapped. And when you start the, uh, the clinical trial phase one, you're already doing manufacturing of that vaccine. This is unheard of for a company to do that just because they don't know if this vaccine will be any good or not. And so they would never do that. But with $10 billion, you can make moves like that. 
And so combining phases, you can cut the time down considerably. So instead of this 12 to 15 years, you're looking at nine, 10, 12 months, you see. And of course, you're all ready to distribute your vaccine after getting approval, at least emergency youth authorization and subsequently FDA approval. And so when we look at the Moderna vaccine, we're seeing a situation where we have a lipid ball that has a piece of RNA in it. It's introduced by injection into the body. And then what happens quickly is that that mRNA is made into a protein, it is processed, and it's shown to the immune system in a very special way. The immune system responds in terms of making antibodies and making important immune cells that will protect you against infection. And that's the mRNA vaccine. Now, the viral vectors is that now you take a virus. And now what you can do, in this case, this is the Pfizer mRNA that is very similar to the strategy for making the Moderna mRNA. So it's exactly the same thing in so many ways. The spike protein uh, sequences are then put into a, a lipid coating ball given to a person that's presented to the immune system and you develop immune cells and antibodies. But the one I wanted to talk about is here, and this is the viral vector system. In this case, you have a situation where you're using a common cold virus like the adenovirus the adenovirus. This adenovirus is a very common virus that doesn't cause any kind of severe disease in a person. And what they do genetically is that they strip all of the adenovirus proteins out of the adenovirus and leave a shell of the adenovirus. And we basically replace that with the spike protein antigen. We stuff that into an adenovirus uh, vector system or vehicle, just like a, a passenger in a taxi cab, and then we're able to deliver that virus by injection to a person. And now the virus will deliver the mRNA in, forms of, in, in, in a DNA form that is then translated into a protein. And of course you get an immune response to it. And so some people were saying at the time they were giving you the COVID virus. No, they were giving you an adenovirus that had a COVID-19 protein encoded in it and it was providing you with that protein that would then uh, allow your immune system to protect you from infection. So the viruses, and again, participants, you can see here, many participants, many of these vaccines were both international. One of the main vaccines that were only done in the United States was the Moderna, but most of the others were international. And again, Johnson & Johnson was a one dose vaccine. And here we see on December 11, 20, uh, 2020, uh, the first vaccine, Pfizer got emergency use on the 18th, Moderna, and in February, Johnson & Johnson. And so this is the main thing that the vaccine will do. In a person that gets a natural infection, you're gonna have a virus entering the cell. And of course the virus then will exit the cell. And again, the immune system will see the virus an antigen presenting cell will basically digest away some of the virus. Some of the virus proteins will be presented to the immune system. This is going to be aided by T cells. These important helper T cells will then allow uh, the development of cytotoxic T cells that will destroy infected cells. And it will also allow the maturation or development of special B cells that will produce antibodies. And, and, and those T cells and these antibodies are basically your defense when you're infected with any kind of virus, COVID-19 included. And so this is just the dosages for the different viruses and how long you have to wait to get your second dose. This is the booster information. And you've gotten that if you've uh, gone to get vaccinated recently or in the past. We know that there are uh, side effects, anaphylaxis, and it's very rare, thrombosis or thrombocytopenia syndrome, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a, an infection which is damaging of the nerves. And again, this is very rare, myocarditis and pericarditis. 
And of course, it's very rare for a person to die after getting a COVID-19 vaccine, very rare. And again, you're looking at 0.0022% among people who might receive the vaccine. And so when we think about the vaccines, uh, the world is using a number of COVID-19 vaccines. The o Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine leads the way in terms of a, 170 countries and territories using that vaccine. And of course, uh, the global progress toward the WHO goal of having 70% of the population fully vaccinated by mid-2022, unlikely to happen. What we have here is uh, a global inequity when it comes to vaccine. You have certain countries, for example, Haiti has about 1% of its population vaccinated. You're talking about countries in Africa and Asia uh, that have very low vaccination rates, not sometimes of their own accord because they don't have access to vaccines. And so that's getting better. And of course the World Health Organization and COVAX is helping with that. And uh, it needs to be done faster. What's in a vaccine, it's very clear. The vaccine is mainly water. There's a few preservatives in there to allow the vaccine to have a long shelf life. There are residual trace elements in the vaccine. There's an adjuvant, and this adjuvant is usually in the form of a salt, and that salt allows the vaccine uh, to stick around, and it gives you, the adjuvant allows you to have a more potent response to the, uh, to the antigen that's injected in the vaccine. And of course, the most important component is a very small uh, active ingredient, a small portion of the harmless form of the bacteria or virus that you're immunizing against. And so I say to everybody, uh, in the 1960s, we only had five vaccines available to us as a country, polio, smallpox, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. Later on, 24 vaccines in the 80, mid 80s, okay? And again, not much different, but in 1986, the liability shield, making vaccines, uh, liability for companies a lot less of a problem. And so the vaccine schedules increase considerably. As of 2019, we get 74 vaccines for a person from your birth to 18 years old. It's not different vaccine. I mean, it's not different vaccines. Some of them are boosters. And this includes, you know, 18 influenza uh, vaccinations that you should get. So Again, but again, you're vaccinated 74 times by the time you're born to 18 years old. And so we are very familiar with vaccinations and, and these vaccinations in our children, let me tell you, they are mandated by the school if your children go to public school. And of course they have been doing that forever. And I talked to parents about this and I asked them out of all the vaccinations that your children are getting going to public school, how many of your children have had adverse events associated with vaccines? And they tell, I don't hear anything. I don't hear much of anything. And the reason being is that vaccines have been safe and effective for decades. It is the most important public health intervention that we know. We live 30 years longer than we did 100 years ago in part to vaccines. And the idea is that we have a lot of experience with vaccines. And again, the experience that we had that were bad, there are very few and far in between. So if you look at the common infections in the United States over time in the 20th century, measles, pertussis, mumps, rubella, smallpox, diphtheria, polio, with the introduction of vaccines, we have seen these infections being reduced 100% in certain cases, 98, 99% because of vaccines. There was a day that children died of measles. You see what I'm saying? Children died of diphtheria. Polio is no longer with us. It's being at the point of eradication. Smallpox is no longer with us because of a global vaccination program. We have people that are against vaccines outright. These are called anti-vaxxers. We have to debunk what these anti-vaxxers are saying. They are making up stories and creating conspiracy theories surrounding the efficacy and safety of vaccines. And uh, I particularly 
am in the business of debunking uh, these uh, uh, these uh, ideas that anti-vaxxers have about vaccines. And some of them, that vaccines are dangerous, that they contain things that are poisonous, that a child's immune system doesn't need any help, that vaccines can give a person allergies and so forth. Vaccines can give you autism and it goes on and on. And so when we look at preventable diseases out there, anti-vaxxers are at risk of causing some of these diseases to come back. And a case in point, I'll tell you, but what we see in Tennessee, and this is something I published in the journal Vaccines, what we see is that in rural communities, there is a hesitancy to get these vaccines. And the reason being is that they don't believe that COVID-19 is a risk to them or their families. Many of them don't even believe COVID-19 exists, that it is a conspiracy between the government and pharmaceutical industries to make money from people. And they have people dying in their communities and they still have this. But what I'm saying is that what we've seen in Tennessee is a microcosm of what we see in the South. These low vaccination rates that persist and vaccine hesitancy that is very high and, and, and is very stubborn too. And so the vaccine myths, they're out there. And we're in the business of debunking them all because again, we know that these vaccines were not rushed. These vaccines won't change your DNA. Uh, you can't get COVID-19 from getting these vaccines because there's no COVID-19 virus in the vaccine. And again, it, it, it can cause side effects, but these side effects are not severe and it will not wake a woman or a man infertile. And so these are things that we have to deal with every day when we talk about vaccines. So when we think about the last word on vaccines, they've been safe and effective. We live longer because of vaccines. They're the most highly scrutinized public health intervention. They go through many different uh, safety checks in terms of phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. They are examined by a data safety monitoring board. And again, the FDA advisory board that I've had the privilege to sit on. And of course, again, the FDA, the CDC making final guidelines. And again, the severity of these are very rare. Vaccines are considered safe for people with autoimmune dysfunctions, pregnant women, and lactating women. And of course, if you're getting a mammogram, again, wait six months after you get your COVID-19 vaccine. And so there have been communities that have stayed away from vaccines, and they have had outbreaks, particularly this one in Brooklyn and Rockland counties, rooted in concerns of a Jewish community who were told that there were pork products in the vaccine and not to take it. And so in 2019, there were 1,282 confirmed cases of measles in the United States. And the United States came to a point where there's a possibility they would lose their measles elimination status. And again, that was initially awarded 20 years ago. So how long will COVID be with us? It could be with us for a long time. It, it doesn't have to be a pandemic at pandemic proportions, but it can be endemic and be problematic. And so long COVID has done a lot of things to people. It has caused fatigue, headache, insomnia, chest pains, joint pain, and so forth. It has caused a lot of problems. And again, this is a continual problem for some folks as well. And of course, now we're looking at ways in which this virus changes through its genetic alterations. And again, this could be a virus picture in the post office. These are all the coronavirus variants that we've gone through either here or globally, and it's only missing the Omicron variant in this. You can see the Delta variant came out of India. And so what I'm looking at now uh, in, in terms of publishing is looking at how this receptor binding domain in the middle there changes over time in this spike protein to lead to mutation events in this virus that can lead to viruses that are more deadly, dangerous, and more transmissible. And what we see clearly is that the dynamics of people that have been vaccinated having breakthrough infections, the dynamic of these breakthrough infections can come three to six months after you've been vaccinated where your antibody levels have gone down and you can get a post-immune infection. And again, this can result of antibody titers being low, 
you can have immunosuppression, you can be elderly, or you can have genetics that would put you at risk. And of course, the Omicron variant, the same thing. Even though this variant is asymptomatic, limited in terms of hospitalizations, and death is rare, we're still talking about a lot of illness. Some people that are older are going to die. And we're still talking about 12 to 1,800 deaths a day during this uh, portion of the pandemic that's been, uh, been basically inundated with this Omicron variant. And so there's another issue that we have to deal with, and that is the transmission of this virus to animals. So when you think about animals that have been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus from humans, it includes animals that you wouldn't expect. Dogs, cats, tigers, lions, leopards, ferrets, white-tailed deer, minks, all of these animals have been affected. And what I'm saying is that we ought to be in a position to monitor this, what is referred to as zoonotic infections of animals with this SARS-CoV-2 virus. Can one of these animals serve as a vessel for the development of a variant that we have no protection with our current vaccines? And so that has to be a concern. I think this should be monitored to make sure that we can handle this going forward. What we know clearly is that these viruses, once they get in the population, they can get going very quickly. So in no time at all, the Delta variant was replaced with the Omicron variant. Within a matter of weeks, within weeks of its emergence, the Omicron variant has taken over. And again, this is a virus that's more contagious. And again, it varies depending upon states because we have different populations within different states. And so one of the things that we have done at Meharry is that we have employed a mobile vaccine unit. And that mobile vaccine unit goes to underserved communities and deliver COVID-19 vaccines, information uh, and, and so forth for those communities that are unable to get access to the vaccine in other ways. We have done this on a large scale and we've included members of volunteers from the dental school, women's groups, uh, sororities, and other uh, volunteers in the hospitals and so forth. And of course, we have gone into communities, elder, elder care facilities. We have gone into churches. We're vaccinating children. And this one individual who couldn't leave his job, we went on his job and vaccinated him while he was working on a forklift. And so we are partners with the Vanderbilt uh, School of Nursing, and that is their uh, vaccination strike teams. We have vaccinated people in their cars. And so we go where people are. And so we think vaccination is a family affair. And so uh, we are uh, collaborating with the Tennessee Department of Health to bring vaccines, and that is uh, regularly scheduled vaccines along with the coronavirus vaccines to young people. And of course, we are in the business of trying to develop a cadre of vaccine ambassadors that will help us. And this will be young people that can encourage young underserved communities to get vaccinated for COVID-19. And of course, we can't leave out pregnant women. And, and here we are giving a widespread baby shower to all the expecting mothers in Nashville to get vaccinated with COVID-19. And again, this is our effort to basically give them information about how important it is to not get COVID and be pregnant because of uh, the complications for yourself and your baby. And so, so uh, just to move ahead. So there's a number of antivirals that are out there. And so many of these antivirals have been tried. Many of them have no clinical benefit against COVID-19. And you can recall hydroxychloroquine uh, that the Trump administration had, had been very proud of. It has been shown that that particular reagent had no clinical benefit and could actually harm a person as well. And so the FDA approved drugs that are out there in terms of antiviral, one of the main ones is remdesivir. And remdesivir has been totally approved by the FDA for use in individuals. And two of the latest treatments that are out there 
are antivirals in the form of pills. And this is molnipravir and plaxivir. Molnipravir, <clears throat> again, these two medications are approved for emergency youth authorization. And again, uh, molnipravir is by Merck and plaxivir is a Pfizer antiviral for the treatment of COVID-19. And you can see the indications here, both one is approved for 18 years old, plaxivir is for 12 and older and so forth. And so this is the information in terms of what is the mechanism of action of the Pfizer drug and the Merck drug. And both of them are designed to inhibit the virus from replicating. And so here, this is a table of all of those reagents that are out there that's been emergency use authorization that has been uh, given and, and, and their reduction in hospitalization, their mode of action and their reduction in mortal mortality. This would also include the monoclonal antibodies that are used to treat patients as well in the hospital. And of course, uh, last but not least, uh, this is our effort at Meharry. In my laboratory, I developed a SARS-CoV-2 uh, COVID-19 antiviral, and I called it MRCV-19, which stands for Meharry's uh, response to COVID-19. When we look at all of the variants out there, these variants are different in small ways. And what we see is that when we look at those small ways, many of those changes that occur in the area of the spike protein that is responsible for binding to the ACE2 receptor that you see there. So my strategy was to make an antiviral that was in a place on the virus that did not go through many of these genetic changes. And if you look at this, at the figure there, you can see there, everywhere you see spikes, these are areas on the, uh, in the viral genome that undergoes many genetic changes. But if you look at the far left in the five prime UTR region near the, near the left-hand end of the ARF1A protein, you see there are very little changes there. And so my strategy was to make an antiviral at a, in an area of the virus that was not going through many changes. What it meant is that my uh, antiviral would be good against any coronavirus that was causing uh, COVID-19, any variant, and would possibly even work against the bad virus because these viruses are all sa the same at that particular area within the viral genome. And so here I just show a schematic is that my antiviral was designed to block a very important uh, translation event. That is the protein that is responsible for replicating the coronavirus my uh, antiviral would bind to the RNA species and prevent the translation of that very important protein that would replicate the virus. And here's just a picture showing what would happen is that my MRCV19 would bind to a com particular component at the left-hand end of the viral genome and prevent translation of that viral product. And when you get no protein, virus replication is completely dead in that particular infection. And we're able to show this in very many ways. This just shows the sequence that I use and I made comparisons with the bat virus and other human viruses showing that the sequence in that particular area of the ARF1A protein was exactly the same in all of these viruses. However, not undergoing hypermutation like some of the other regions within the viral genome. And again, this in my mind was the ideal component to basically target for an antiviral strategy against COVID-19. And this is what this structural morpholino looks like. It has a large guanidinium group that you can see there. It has, this is an octoguanidinium dendromer, this large head group, and then you have a morpholino oligomer that's there. So this morpholino oligomer is a 25-mer that it basically binds to the COVID-19 RNA when it's inside the cell. It's easy for us to get this oligomer uh, with its uh, guanidinium head group inside the cell 
uh, and this is called an in vivo Marfolino. And this in vivo Marfolino can effectively prevent uh, uh, cells from being infected uh, and, and reduce virus load. And this is just everything together here showing you how this is done, where it binds, how it affects, and it also shows you the oligomer that's there. And here we're just showing the IC50 or the ability of this virus to, to basically shut down infection in an in vitro assay of infected cells. We also show to the right that the cell viability, meaning that this reagent is not toxic to the cells as well. And so here what we do, we look at a number of different comparators, that is hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir, again, remdesivir being already uh, for uh, approved, fully approved, and hydroxychloroquine being touted as an important drug at one time. And what we show is that our drug, our reagent, in, in, in so many ways is as good or better than hydroxychloroquine or remdesivir in this cytopathic assay that we've done. And the funding, I want to say, for the Meharry Medical College Mobile Vaccine Program was by the Bloom Blurk for Philanthropies, the Greenwood Initiative. The PI is Dr. Dwayne Smoot at Meharry. He is the PI for the mobile vaccine unit. And of course, this would not be possible without the Tennessee SEAL program. And you can see the NIH uh, funding vehicle there. And of course, the PI for this program is Dr. Paul Juarez at Meharry. And the funding for the MRCV-19 drug was provided by the Meharry Startup Award and the Meharry GT collaboration. Thank you for having me. I think I went over. And that's okay, Dr. Ellison. I apologize for that. <laughs> it was a very interesting topic. And we do have quite a few questions in the chat. Absolutely. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Cooper, who will be facilitating our Q&A session. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for this amazing presentation, Dr. Allison Dorr. Thank you. Um, the yeah. first question we have is actually from Dr. Homan, and it says, what made the MIRS infection subside? Uh, can you repeat that? I missed that. What made the MIRS infection um, subside? Middle East, and I probably put the abbreviation. Oh, so, so the what idea is the that this, this, in, this infection was uh, caused by an, uh, a zoonotic infection with uh, uh, camels. And so it was transmitted by camels to humans. And again, about 8,000 people died. And again, when a virus doesn't have enough people to infect, and remember, in certain places in the desert, in, 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 uh, in these dry areas, there's not a lot of people there and it's very hot and virus needs fresh bodies to transmit itself. And so that, that really never happened. And the idea is that the people that were close by, those individuals that came in contact with one another, they became infected. But again, a very serious infection in that 35% mortality, this is the kind of virus that can kill neighborhoods. And, and again, this virus more likely is not as fit as the SARS-CoV-2 virus. You see what I'm saying? Meaning that it's, it may not be as highly transmissible uh, uh, cause uh, affecting its, its, its ability to spread to populations. And of course, being in a place where you don't have a, a concentrated uh, population could also cause a virus not to, to really make it going. Okay, thanks. Thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. So our next question says, does the involvement of ACE2 imply some connection between COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease as well as cerebral diseases? Yeah, so in terms of cardiac disease, it's very clear that a person that has cardiac, uh, a cardiac disease and get COVID-19, one of the, uh, the clinical findings is that those that have a more difficult time with COVID uh, display uh, clinical, uh, a, a clinical profile that uh, leads to uh, a tremendous amount of inflammation. And, and that inflammation is not easy to go away. 
And, and, and another thing is that the, the heart, that is cardiomyocytes, express uh, the ACE2 protein. And there's evidence that the cardiomyocytes undergo apoptosis by uh, dysregulation of calcium. And the idea is that that combination of having a, a weak heart and the problems that you would have in your lungs would, would put you at, at risk of dying if you were to have COVID-19 to where uh, it becomes severe. Uh, and, and, and so the idea is that not having a strong heart makes you less able to be able to uh, deal with uh, a serious lung infection uh, and of course, uh, lung damage. So, so uh, again, with lungs that are damaged, all visceral organs are at risk in terms of not getting what they need to, to function normally. And so uh, the ACE2 protein being expressed on these cardiomyocytes, that in itself suggests that it, it's problematic. Now, uh, in terms of the brain, uh, there is evidence that there are certain cells in the brain that may be infected. Uh, and again, uh, they even uh, think that maybe even the brain stem might be uh, 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 damaged as well, uh, because there has to be something, and again, many people believe that it may be cytokines that are produced as part of the inflammatory insult by the virus that is causing some of the problems that they see that's associated with brain fog and, and memory loss that they see in some of those individuals that have long COVID. Okay, thank you so much for that answer. Um, the next question says, can you shed a light on the throb, sorry, thromboembolism in COVID causing increased D-dimer and differential of pul pulmon sorry, pulmonary embolism? <laughs> yeah, so in, in certain individuals that have lower lung infections, and the alveoli in the lower lung are damaged, uh, then what happens is that the pulmonary capillaries, they are juxtapositioned the alveoli of the lung. And when the alveoli are damaged, uh, the ability to transfer oxygen to pulmonary capillaries so that they can bring that oxygenated blood to other visceral organs is disrupted in a very serious way. Another thing is that uh, COVID-19 can also affect uh, endothelial cells of the vasculature that can lead to microclots and, and of course, emboli. And if this happens in the pulmonary capillaries, then that can result in pulmonary emboli. And of course, pulmonary emboli can be life-threatening. Do you see what I'm saying? So having clots in the lungs can be, can be life-threatening for a person. And of course, if you're older and you have underlying comorbidities, this is, could be a, a long hospital stay even if you survive. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the next question says, please, what's your opinion on the role of KIM-1 as opposed to ACE2 in the entry of SARS-CoV-2? CoV well, I think, I think ACE2 is going to be predominant over something like CHEM1. And, and, and again, uh, when you look at the ability of the, uh, the binding protein uh, pocket of the spike protein, uh, you're likely to have more infection uh, with ACE2 compared to, to CHEM1, okay? And, and the idea is that when you look at the variations, that result in viruses that are more infectious, it's associated with uh, changes that happen in the, uh, the RBD domain as it relates to binding to ACE2. Uh, and so I think what you, I think the way you have to look at this is, is this way. When you have a variant, the variant has to do a couple of things. The variant has to survive in the midst of neutralizing antibodies. But, and, and uh, with whatever changes it might make to the spike protein, it also has to be able to survive being able to bind to the receptor binding domain and ACE2. So, so the idea is that 
you can think of it as of having a, a, a line of cars, an assembly line. And, and, and only a few of them will have an engine, all the tires they need and, and, and everything in order to be transmitted and, and, and be functional in the environment and cause disease. And, 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 so, uh, and so that's what you're looking at in a, in a lot of ways. And so uh, when you look at those things, you can see that being able to survive those changes that might occur in the RBD domain and still being able to bind to ACE2 is going to be a preference when it comes to the development of variants as well. Thank you so much. And I think this next question is actually a follow-up or similar to the last question. Mm -hmm. It says, is there actually an antibody titer which indicates sufficient protection against SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, so, so that's a very powerful question. And, and, and the idea is that I put this in my lab, I put this same question in the paper that I'm writing on breakthrough infections. So what we have been doing for the longest time is, is using uh, antibodies as, as a surrogate for a protection in a sense. Uh, so, so the idea is that the antibody level that's required for protection against SARS-CoV-2, we don't know what that is. We, we've never known what that is. And, and the idea is that the level of antibodies in an individual that's required to keep you from being sick, that has been undefined. Now, now one of the things is that I, 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 in my paper, I put an experiment in there. And this experiment has to do with looking at the peri-infection neutralizing antibody titers. So this study was done in a hospital with hospital personnel. And what they did is that they took blood from them on a routine basis. And what they did, they were able to determine their neutralizing antibody titers five days before they became PCR positive for COVID-19. That is referred to as the peri-infection period. That peri-infection period, and, and what they did is they looked at the likelihood of what your antibody titers were at the peri-infection period prior to PCR positivity, and the likelihood of you would develop a breakthrough infection. That is, you've been vaccinated, but then you get reinfected. So what they found is that when the peri-infection neutralizing antibody titers were fairly high, the person was less likely to experience a breakthrough infection. When, when they were low, these individuals were more likely to have a breakthrough infection, suggesting that there, there more than likely is a steady state neutralizing antibody titer that is protective but that's gonna vary with many things. How much virus you, you, you're exposed to, it's likely the, what kind of virus you're exposed to, under what conditions. And of course, your response to the COVID-19 vaccine can vary from one individual to the next. And there are certain people that will not respond at all to the vaccine. They won't make antibodies to the vaccine. And there's some people uh, that will have a great response to the vaccine. If you notice, uh, very young children are not responding well to the Pfizer vaccine right now. And so, so, so uh, it's not a sure thing. It's going to be different in every, pe every person. And of course, this is one of the reasons why we would want to make sure that people that have immune suppression or for that matter, underlying comorbidities are properly boosted uh, with COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, and so for the next question, it says, which age group are the most vaccine hesitant and is it different by race? And they said they feel like young adults are probably the most resistant. Yeah, yeah. so, so it, it, is, it is young adults. And this is my experience when being in the field with the vaccinators. And, 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 and that range can be uh, teenagers, to, to early, all the way to the 30s, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and the thing about it is, is that there's a tremendous amount of misinformation that still lingers with this group. And, and the idea is that uh, you can scare people away by telling them that getting a vaccine will, will make them infertile. You see what I'm saying? Some people are not going to you know, go farther than that. That's enough for them to say no forever. 
And then you have people that believe that the vaccine uh, won't do anything uh, for them and that they don't need it. And the reason they don't need it becomes very strange because they'll tell me, well, I got, I never had a cold and I never got the, the influ I never got influenza so, and I never got the influenza vaccine. And I don't know how they put that together, meaning that if they've never had influenza and they never got the COVID vaccine, they're thinking that COVID-19 goes through the same mechanism and the same result. And so what I get, it's younger people, uh, they, they are very cavalier about it, meaning that they're always telling me about a friend that had it and nothing happened. And, and again, what we see is that this level of vaccine hesitancy in rural communities is more serious than we've seen in urban communities. Uh, but again, a vaccine hesitancy I've seen a lot of in African-American populations. Uh, when we went and gave a baby shower and offering vaccines to expecting mothers, uh, black mothers, they simply didn't want the vaccine. And, and again, uh, out of concern for the baby, but at the same time, they many of them told me uh, that their OBGYN uh, encouraged them to get the vaccine, but they still didn't want it. And so, and again, they knew about the complications of not having the vaccine and getting COVID and, and how serious it can be for them and their baby. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and the next question is, um, is it all age ranges now that are able to take the booster dose? Well, the idea is that booster dose uh, for, the, for the very young folks, you know what I mean? Uh, five to 11, uh, again, that, that's gonna be problematic. You see what I'm saying? So, so they're still working there. And of course, we don't see anything for the, uh, the six months to four years old that has been put on the shelf for a while. They are looking at the third dose because they're not seeing good enough uh, protection in these very young people that are six months to four years old. So five to 11 uh, boosters for them. We, we, haven't, we haven't been doing much of that in our vaccination, uh, with our vaccination team. But uh, the, the, the second group, you know, 15 on up, we, we've been giving boosters to them routinely. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question says, has anyone looked into Tanzania in Africa that completely refused to acknowledge COVID and continued with life as usual during the pandemic? I'm sure people, I'm sure people died, but maybe not like USA. So did they achieve herd immunity? They might be a great control group to a study if they let you in. Yeah, so, so we've seen the same kind of thing in Haiti as well, meaning that uh, you have very low vaccination rates, 1%. And certain ports of, portions of Africa, you have very low vaccination rates. And, 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 and to our surprise, uh, many people are not concerned in, in some ways. And again, uh, the idea is that we know that in all of those countries, you have people with underlying comorbidities. We know that we have people that have all of these issues with heart disease, hypertension, and so forth. And, and we know that people are dying in those communities as well. But, but, but again, you know, uh, I think it has to do with attitude and culture about the vaccine. And, and uh, the idea is that they're not seeing a lot of death around them. You know what I'm saying? And, and for, the, for some people that, that can be encouraging that uh, you know, this virus may be going away in their communities. You know what I'm saying? But again, uh, this has been problematic. Uh, and again, when you're looking at different cultures, different cultures look at vaccines in a different way. So uh, I was writing this about the, uh, you know, the different cultures and how they see vaccines in a vaccine hesitancy paper. And it was, it was very interesting where some of the clergy in African countries were against the vaccine. And they were you know, telling their congregation to not get the vaccine. And, and, and again, uh, the vaccine, uh, they have misgivings about vaccines from the very beginning, going back to the polio vaccine, they didn't want it. And there's also a concern about people not liking needles in Africa as well. So, so it's, it's a mixed bag of a lot of things. And again, you have this 
idea that if you're young and you're able, then COVID-19 is very different for you. And if you're looking around and you're not seeing people all around you hospitalized and people with long COVID and all of these things, then in a lot of ways, you might come to a conclusion that, that we've seen even in rural communities in Tennessee, that COVID-19 is not really a threat to me and my family. And some people have, have become okay with that. And, and we have evidence everywhere that says something different. You see what I'm saying? Thank you so much. Um, the next question says, do you think we are relaxing too soon with the new mask mandate? I, I gave an interview for uh, the Daily Beagle in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and another uh, newspaper called Chalk Beat last week, and they asked me that exact question. And, 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 and in New York, they wanted to tie vaccine uh, mass mandates with uh, vaccination uh, rates within school districts. And uh, what I said is that I think tying vaccination rates and mass mandates together, I think it's a good idea. And the reason being is that if you have certain school districts, like I was told in Brooklyn, New York, where the vaccination rate is 27%, I think that community spread in that particular school district is much more serious than some of the other school districts where vaccination is in this 80% range, 90% range. And so I'm saying that it depends. And, and, and the idea is that if you have low level uh, 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 community spread and, and this is being managed in a particular school district, then I think uh, mass should be optional. Uh, and, and again, uh, we have seen changes here in Tennessee as well. But I still think keeping masks optional is a good thing. We have been here before where we have gone through a period of relaxing uh, and being less vigilant about COVID-19. It has taught us a hard lesson. And the idea is that we know this virus changes and these changes uh, can lead to uh, more problems. And, and the idea is that what we like is that we'd like to be vigilant, we'd like to be cautious, and, and we'd like to take a measured approach to dealing with this virus. Because as long as we see 2,000 people dying every day, I would say we're not done with COVID. As long as we have you know, millions of people unvaccinated, and we have unvaccinated pockets of people all throughout the United States, uh, I don't think we're done with COVID. And when you see the global inequities in terms of vaccination, we could have another variant come out of country X tomorrow. And within a matter of weeks, it would be here, causing a tremendous amount of uh, problems here. And of course, when you look at animals that are acquiring this infection, we don't know where that's gonna go. And so I'm just saying, we need to continue to monitor this. We need to be flexible. We need to take it a measured approach. And when we do things, it should be targeted and it should be managed well. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, the next question says, can one take two different vaccine doses? If one takes two different doses, will the first one be canceled? Meaning one will then take three doses, one dose different than the other vaccine taken twice. So, so for us, you take your first dose of your vaccine. If it's Pfizer, you wait 21 days. If it's Moderna, you wait 28 days. We are following CDC guidelines as basically discouraging people to take the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for particular reasons. So when you get your second dose of the vaccine, 21 or 28 days later, then we would consider boosters. Now, in your second dose, you are given the option to mix and match vaccines, meaning that if you took Moderna, you can take Pfizer, okay? Again, if you took Pfizer, then you can take Moderna. There are still people that want the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and they actually ask for it. 
And so we are equipped in our, uh, with our vaccine teams to provide all three vaccines. And, uh, and again, you can do mixing, matching of vaccines. And there's evidence that says that if you mix and match, you can get different responses. And, and I'll just say this out because uh, this has been uh, published and that is, well, this study has been done that if, you, if the component that you're mixing and matching with includes Moderna, it has been shown that you get a better immune response with a Moderna mix. Oh, that's so interesting. Thank you so much for that answer. Yeah. Um, our next question says, um, how did the role of ivermectin on SARS-CoV-2 control? Yeah, I'm not sure. So, so, so the idea is that ivermectin came out of when you're when you're looking for something in the laboratory, and you find that you get inhibition of a virus, no matter what it is, then what happens is that it takes off. And at the beginning of the pandemic, when there were very few therapeutic interventions, you know what I'm saying? And uh, of course, the vaccines were, were not uh, widely available. You saw drugs like hy uh, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin uh, show up. And, and the reason being is that these were, uh, these were reagents that you could get relatively easy. You, you didn't have to go to a doctor. And some people are saying they would rather take some of these reagents than get a vaccine, meaning that they felt that taking uh, a reagent like ivermectin that, was pres that can be prescribed as an anti-helminthic, meaning that it is used to treat people that have worms and of course, animals that have worms, you know what I'm saying? Uh, even with that indication, people were willing to take a medication that had that was unproven for COVID-19, had no indications for COVID-19, and possibly could cause side effects uh, uh, that can be detrimental to their health. They were willing to do that and not take the vaccine. And, and the reason why this took off in a lot of ways is that things start from the top. Yeah, the president of the United States at the time uh, saying how he had people who were able to show that ivermectin was effective and, and it did this, that, or the other. There are still people in Japan that says ivermectin, uh, you know, could be a, an important uh, intervention for COVID-19. So I, I think when you look at overall, studies were done and they were done over and over again, showing that ivermectin uh, really did not have any clinical benefit as an intervention for COVID-19, and that it also had detrimental effects in terms of side effects causing uh, cardiac issues as well. So, so the idea is that you still had people that were famous in sports and on television and on the news, some news channels, uh, glorifying ivermectin as the treatment for COVID-19. And at the time, remember, ivermectin got, uh, was trying to get emergency authorization. Hydroxychloroquine did get emergency authorization that was later revoked. You see what I'm saying? And so the idea is that, uh, you know, when we take medications as therapeutic interventions for disease, uh, this has to go through clinical trials and so forth. Ivermectin and some of these others, hydroxychloroquine, yes, they were used uh, in people, but again, for indications of COVID-19, uh, not so much. And so I think what you're looking at is uh, relabeling of drugs for other indications. And sometimes uh, these drugs can have side effects that can be detrimental. And I think ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine would be uh, in that class. But again, there are many people that are, that are willing to, to take these medications and still take them. I would like to just quickly say that we officially have come to the end of our time, but this is such an important topic. Sure. I want to cut it short. So if you 
don't mind to be available to answer the remaining questions. Uh, if you have that time, then we can just keep the conversation open. Uh, what's your feeling about it? Absolutely. Let's keep the conversation going. All right. Nera, I don't know whether you want to log off and give me the hosting. You are currently co-host, but I'm enjoying the conversation, so I'm, I'm going to <laughs> hang on as well. Um, so, okay. Uh, so let's cut off the questions, the new questions right now and yeah. just finish the ones out that are in the chat right now. Mm -hmm. Alicia, are you okay with that or do you want me to take over? I'm okay. Okay, keep going then. <laughs> okay, so um, the next question says, how did COVID, the COVID-19 vaccine relate to DNA? Does it change DNA? So let's think about it this way. On, on one of the graphics I showed you, the COVID-19 virus is a positive sense RNA virus. Now, what that means is that when the RNA is then released from the viral particle and be in the cytoplasm of the cell, it will interact with what we call polyribosomes in the cytoplasm. And that RNA will be translated into a polyprotein or a very long protein that has to be proteolytically cleaved or processed, right? The virus never goes to the nucleus for anything that it has to do. And the idea of changing your DNA requires at least a visit to the nucleus because that's where your DNA uh, uh, that it's involved in uh, genetic inheritance, it's going to be. So again, we have never seen any type of mutation events or for that matter, increases in cancer because mutations, when people think about mutations, they're really thinking about changes in your DNA that can lead to uh, maybe uh, uh, cancer or other kinds of abnormalities or for that matter, birth defects or whatever. We have yet to see any information that would support the notion that your DNA is altered after giving a, getting a COVID-19 vaccine that would put you at risk of developing cancer or any type of other abnormality related to genetic exchange. Thank you. Um, so the next question says, what is the mechanism of action of your newly developed drug as it is known that remdesivir stalls the transcription process by binding to RDRP? Yeah, and so, uh, so my reagent, MRCV19, it simply binds to the five prime UTR of the PP1A locus of the, uh, the major transcript, okay? And the idea is that the, the, the major transcript, the PP1A locus, along with the PP1B, encodes the polyprotein that is the first protein that is translated uh, during infection. And that's why it was very important for me to do it for a protein that came first. And the reason being is that when you basically are able to shut down the first protein that's expressed by the virus, you have no downstream uh, effects happening, meaning that you don't get a buildup of other viral proteins at certain uh, other areas in the replication cycle. And so I felt that stopping the virus in terms of inhibiting, by inhibiting translation, what we call translation arrest, was the best way to be able to shut the virus down without any buildup of viral proteins. So you shut down the virus at the most earliest opportune moment in the replication cycle. And that's what my strategy was. And so other ways to shut the virus down during the, if you're interfering with the replicase is that what, what can happen is that if the replicase is allowed to develop and goes through proteolytic cleavage and is assembled, then you might be able to make some virus. My strategy by inhibiting the, the replicase translation, that would never happen. You see what I'm saying? Okay, thank you so much. Um, so our next question says, have you seen increased complications in patients with pacemakers who have con contracted COVID? I, I haven't seen it personally, but I can tell you if you had a pacemaker, it means that you had some type of cardiovascular event that required a pacemaker. 
And the idea is that a pacemaker is designed to help you do what the heart normally would do. But we know that if it's not the heart itself, and you know that a person with a pacemaker is a person that uh, has more than likely underlying comorbidities. If you have a pacemaker, you probably have a heart that is not very strong. And if your heart is not very strong, it makes your body weak. And the idea is that you also have other underlying conditions for people that have pacemakers. They have other issues, medical issues. And so those other medical issues are going to put you at a greater risk of COVID-19. And, and, and they don't even have to tell me what those medical issues are. If you required a pacemaker, it's very likely that you have a weak heart, an irregular heartbeat. And the idea is that you're likely to be older. And if you're older, age is, is one of the most important underlying risk factors for the severe symptoms of COVID-19. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question says, how do you see the risk of letting individuals who tested positive return to work without another test? Yeah, so, or for that matter, return to work after only a few days. What, what I'm saying is that when you, when you get COVID and then you quarantine and then you come back without testing uh, negative, uh, I think it can be problematic, especially when we know that virus can be around for a long time. And, and so when you think about viruses being around for, for two to three months in a person's system, you got to ask yourself, if you don't test negative, you may still be harboring virus. And so this basically caused a big stir among uh, experts in COVID that people were going, were allowed to come out of quarantine uh, much quicker. You see what I'm saying? And to come out much quicker and not testing negative when they come out, you would think that that may be a person that could transmit an infection. And, and, and another thing, especially when the Delta variant was around, because the Delta variant, there's very little of the Delta variant still around right now. The Delta variant was highly contagious. This virus left the trail of tears, meaning that it killed a lot of people. And, and the idea is that Delta variant left a lot of uh, long haulers for COVID as well. And, and Delta variant was more serious in terms of disease and death and infection than the Omicron variant. And so, so the idea is that when you think about that, these viruses can cause complications that, that, that we're never ready for. And, and so uh, when you think about it, uh, it can be problematic. Okay, so um, the next question says, is there any difference between the COVID-19 vaccines, for example, AstraZeneca and Moderna? A, a whole lot of differences. And I had, I had a couple of slides that pointed that out. So the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine and, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine are very similar. These are what we call viral vector vaccines. And so what you have is an adenovirus vector for both Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca. And what they've done is that they've inserted in the adenovirus vector, like a, you know, a passenger in a taxi, the passenger being the, M, uh, the spike protein uh, gene. And again, it's given to you as an injection. And this adenovirus that is what we refer to as replication incompetent, then all it serves is a delivery vehicle. It would just open the door and let the DNA that's gonna be transcribed and translated in the cytoplasm and made into a spike protein that the body will see as an immunogen that will uh, cause an immune response to protect you from infection. So the mRNA vaccines like Moderna and Pfizer, basically, they're basically taking a lipid ball, putting an mRNA cassette that they get in there, and then delivering that with an adjuvant uh, as an injection. And then the mRNA now is in your body, and it makes a protein that your body recognizes as foreign, because it's a viral protein 
that is encoded by the mRNA, and then you're able to mount an immune response to it. So the Pfizer, Moderna are mRNA vaccines, and the AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson are viral or adenoviral vector vaccines. They both have been effective, but you can see that the mRNA vaccines could start something very different for vaccines in general. We have rarely seen vaccines with efficacy in the mid 90s. There's only a few vaccines that we have traditionally throughout all of the vaccines that we have that approach these levels of efficacy. What that means is that the mRNA vaccines, you might see people starting to push this very hard to use mRNA vaccines for common things that we get vaccinated for, like influenza, measles, mumps, and rubella. Again, that vaccine is pretty good. But I'm saying some of those vaccines that have shown to have efficacy uh, you know, below 60%, sometime below 50%, like influenza vaccine. So what you see is some of the companies now are starting to make what is referred to as combinatorial vaccines. Combinatorial vaccines are, are, are when you have an mRNA cassette where you have multiple antigens on that mRNA cassette that allows you to vaccinate a person for war, more than one disease. And so the idea of being able to vaccinate a person for COVID-19 and influenza at the same time. And it's believed that maybe an mRNA influenza vaccine will be much better than uh, the attenuated live vaccines that we have today for influenza. Great, thank you so much. Um, our next question is, please, have you considered the evaluation of T cell response to SARS-CoV-2 besides humoral response, especially in those who do not produce adequate level of antibodies following the complete dose of the vaccine? Yeah, so, so this is the thing that you never hear on the news and you never hear people talk about, and that is the T cell response. I showed a slide that showed how the T helper cell through soluble factors are able to allow B cells that have been presented with antigen in the context of MHC is able to differentiate into a plasma cell. That plasma cell duty, which is fully differentiated to produce antibodies. These same soluble factors are used to drive the differentiation of cytotoxic T cells to enable them to kill virus infected cells. And so what you hear very little about is the T memory cells that are there that everybody has to some extent. Now, is the response the same or different in different people? Yes, it's gonna be different in different people. And it goes back to an earlier question is, can we define a neutralizing antibody level that is protective against SARS-CoV-2? Now, when you think about it, that's gonna depend on the virus and how infectious that virus is as well. So there's gonna be many things that are gonna be dependent upon your protection by antibodies. Now, what people have not talked a lot about is T cell functions. T cell functions are very important, but they have used neutralizing antibody titers as a surrogate for your immune response to the vaccine since the beginning of time, since the beginning of the, the pandemic. And so what you need to do is start to start looking at how the T cell response is happening. And so what people are, is doing, so what people are looking at right now is the possibility of developing a T cell responsive vaccine. You see what I'm saying? And the idea is that can you develop a vaccine that will stimulate T cell the T cell repertoire in a way that can extend protection. So one of the things that people are all around are concerned about, even the companies, is that whenever they give their big time eff efficacious vaccine to a person, the vaccine, the neutralizing antibodies start to wane in three to six months, okay? There are other vaccines that we get that, you know, we only get them twice in our lifetime. We get boosters every now and then, but we can go 10 years without getting some vaccine. And, and you would hope that that would be the same for COVID. It is not. And the idea is that 
with COVID, we are on our second boosters already. The possibility of getting a third booster is, is, is being talked about routinely. And the vaccine companies want this to happen. They're not all that interested in COVID going away completely. You know what I'm saying? And I, and I, I would say this in the same realm, I know they don't want people to die of COVID-19, but again, they're a business. But again, I think what you're looking at is the possibility of developing vaccines that would stimulate T cell responses and T cell responses are noted for their ability to be long lasting. And the idea is that if a vaccine could be manipulated in a way to make it uh, more likely to develop a strong T cell response, then it's likely to last longer because the idea of being able to get a COVID vaccine every three to six months, uh, some people that are hesitant this is one of the reasons why they don't want to start getting the vaccine in the first place, because they think it'll never stop. Great, thank you so much. Um, this is the last question. It says, mm -hmm. what are the prospects of summer internship programs for uh, PhD students in your facility? Well, we, we don't have a strict summer internship program. Usually to go into a lab, you have to have, you have to be an existing student that has been uh, aligned with the program, meaning that you've been accepted into microbiology, immunology, and physiology. And through that mechanism, uh, you are able to, uh, to traffic through laboratories to do uh, you know, lab work with a couple of investigators until you get to a point where you decide exactly what lab and what particular research you'd like to pursue. And so, uh, so, so, so this is the way it's done. Uh, now, if we have people, we have programs sometimes where a person can come in in the summer. And so I've had summer students, but the summer students I have are usually uh, coming out of the Vanderbilt Scientific uh, uh, Scholars Program, and they will come to the lab. See, when you come into a lab and we're working with viruses and dangerous chemicals and so forth, uh, a student, if they're not a student in the university or the medical school, uh, there's a lot of risk that they have to uh, take and there's a lot of protections involved for them. And so for people to just come and volunteer, it's very different when you're working in a, in a lab situation where we work in a BSL-3 uh, facility uh, where you have to go in and leave all those things that you bring in in there. It has separate facilities that is self-contained. And, and, and again, you, need, you have to have proper training uh, that lasts longer than a summer uh, to be able to work in those facilities. Do you uh, have- For example, I uh, just wanna say that for example, if a, if a summer student was to come into the lab and contract an infection, uh, uh, while they're there because they don't have the training, uh, that would be a particular concern for the university uh, and, and the medical school. What about uh, the outreach programs? So we, we do have outreach programs that are involved in uh, community outreach. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a lot of that. And, and this is where uh, individuals can serve as vaccine ambassadors. That's one particular thing. Also outreach for people to serve as community health workers, and you can get paid for that. Uh, and so we, we do a whole lot of outreach and we include faith-based communities as well. We interact with churches. Uh, we also interact with a number of uh, community-based organizations to expand our outreach because in a lot of ways we need capacity. And to only to do that, we need to really uh, go outside of, of what we can do in house and partner with people that, that have extensions into the community, embedded in the community, uh, and, uh, and, and, and being trusted by that community. So uh, the idea of having trusted messengers within the community is very important to us. We know that showing up in a white coat will do nothing for you in, in these underserved communities. We know that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I guess, um, but, but there is one new question uh, since I just started the stream. Um, I, 
think we should address this. So the student says, how, so could we be absorbed into an out outreach program? Mm -hmm. um, this person is a microbiologist. Now, I think what we just heard um, at, uh, you know, in response to the student is they need local people. Um, one thing that I would like to suggest to some of the, I know some of the students here who showed interest were graduate students from the School of Public Health here mm -hmm. at, our, at Morgan State. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I would like to um, refer you, if you're from the School of Public Health to Dr. Yvonne Bronner and mm -hmm. to Dr. Payam Shikatari, oh, okay. uh, who are working in Baltimore with the community, with outreach programs. Mm -hmm. So if you would like to get um, involved on that level, uh, please talk to those individuals. They're professors in the School of Public Health. Okay. If you are uh, a PhD student in bioenvironmental science, same thing. Dr. Payam Shikatari and Dr. Yvonne Brona, I'm gonna put these names into the chat. Okay, thank you so much. I'm not a very fast typer. Um, actually, um, tell you what, um, send me an email, that's faster. And I sent you the names. <laughs> You have my name here, Christine Dodhoman and Morgan at EDU. I don't mm -hmm. want to hold everybody up with my slow typing. So I think we have come to the end of it now. Um, it's almost six o'clock. Uh, this was really wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Alcindor. I appreciate and you having me. Felicia, thank you so much. You did a wonderful job. Um, and so, um, Thanks again, and um, we will see hopefully all the people in attendance here next week. I can't remember who our next speaker is, but I think for the rest of the semester, it's pretty much focus. The focus is pretty much going to be on health disparities work. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, Dr. Alson. Thank you for having me. Everybody, have a good evening. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.